Welcome to Time Travelling Team, the weekly podcast where we review every episode of Doctor Who right from the very beginning. I'm Trisha. And I'm Paddy. In today's story, we'll get our first look at the Doctor's most fearsome enemies, the Daleks. The Daleks is a seven-episode story, so without further ado, let's jump into the recap. Episode 1, The Dead Planet. We pick up where we left off last time, with our travellers exiting the TARDIS, not noticing the rise on the readout of the Geiger counter. They walk out into a forest that appears to be growing from sand and ash. Upon closer inspection, they realise that all the trees are petrified. The Doctor is determined to discover what could have caused this phenomenon. Ian and Barbara meanwhile contemplate their situation. They realise it could be a very long time before they are returned home. They agree that they will have to keep an eye on the Doctor, as they believe he has a tendency to get himself into trouble. The further into the forest they go, the more unusual flora and fauna they discover, which confirms that they are not on Earth. From the edge of the forest, they can see a magnificent city off in the distance. The Doctor wishes to investigate it, but the others feel that it could be an unnecessary distraction and suggest they discuss it in the morning, as it is too late to do anything now. On their way back to the TARDIS, Susan stops to pick up a flower and the others walk on. She suddenly acts terrified and is convinced that someone is watching her and has touched her. She runs back to the others in hysterics. The Doctor says that he finds it difficult to interact with Susan at times due to their age difference, and Barbara offers to speak to her for him. Susan is fed up that no one seems to believe her. Barbara reassures her that she does believe her, and after the Doctor, it's a case that her story contradicts his scientific belief that no one could live out in such a desolated place. Ian and the Doctor are arguing about their current situation. Ian begs the Doctor to see it from his point of view, that they are unwilling participants in this journey, but the Doctor reminds him that he and Barbara barged their way into the TARDIS in the first place. The Doctor uses Ian's arguments to suggest that it is time to eat, and they go and rejoin the women. They are shown to a food replicator, which they marvel at. As they are enjoying their meal, they can hear a banging sound from outside the TARDIS. They see nothing through the view screen, and the Doctor once again wishes to investigate the city, but the others reason with him to leave. He gives in to their request and activates the console, but he surreptitiously sabotages a navigational component known as a fluid link. He discovers the fault and says that he requires liquid mercury to make the component work again, but laments that they don't have any on board. Ian sees through the ruse and suggests that maybe the city might have some. The doctor agrees and delightedly says that he will go at first light. Outside, they discover a box containing glass vials of some unknown liquid. The doctor asks that they be brought into the TARDIS for later assessment. They arrive at the city, all of them showing signs of unexpected fatigue. Barbara discovers a door, and then Ian breaks the carnal rule of all RPGs. He splits the party and suggests that they explore and regroup in ten minutes. Ian, Susan and the Doctor all return, but Barbara seems to have gotten lost in the maze-like layout of the corridors. However, in actuality, she is being herded into an elevator. Once the doors open, she continues her investigation when she encounters something coming down the hallway towards her. All we can see is some sort of plunger-like appendage, but whatever it is causes Barbara to scream out in terror. Episode 2, The Survivors The others begin searching for Barbara and are drawn to a strange ticking sound. They enter a room full of scientific analysis equipment and discover the source of the ticking is actually a Geiger counter. They notice the reading is at a dangerously high level, and the doctor deduces that this is the reason for the state of the forest. He also theorizes that it was most likely a type of neutron bomb that caused it, and that would explain why only inorganic matter was not affected. He also deduces that the reason for their fatigue is that they are suffering from radiation sickness. He admits that there was nothing wrong with the fluid link, and only invented the need for the mercury so he could explore the city. He says that they should leave at once, but Ian refuses to leave Barbara behind. The doctor says that Ian can stay if he wishes, but he and Susan will be going. However, Ian holds the fluid link component hostage and repeats that they will not leave without Barbara. Left with no other choice, the doctor agrees to help search for Barbara. As they leave the room, they are surrounded by several of the creatures that Barbara earlier encountered. They look like some sort of robotic battle bumper car with a large singular eye stalk and two appendages sticking out from their body. One of the appendages is revealed to be a gun which paralyzes Ian's legs as he attempts to make a break for it. The three prisoners are brought to a cell and reunited with Barbara. She says that she cannot reveal anything about their captors, but she gets the feeling that they are not just machines, but that there could be something inside them. Ian informs her of their radiation sickness, and the doctor, who is seemingly affected worse than the others, says that they will need treatment as soon as possible or they could die. Their captors are discussing the current stage of the radiation, and even though it has come down, it is still dangerously high. One of the creatures asks why their prisoners are affected when he knows that the Thals are capable of living on the surface thanks to some type of drug. They bring the doctor up for interrogation and ask why he and the other Thals are sick. He says they are not Thals, but travellers. 
However, the creatures don't believe him and state that he is, must have come into the city to find some, sort, some more of the anti-radiation drugs. The doctor realises that this is what must have been in the metal box earlier. He offers to be taken under guard to the TARDIS to retrieve the box, but the creatures reveal that they cannot travel outside the city. He then offers that one of them should go alone and the others remain as hostages. He also asks to know more about the Thals. The creatures, who reveal themselves to be called Daleks, say that over 500 years ago, they and the Thals waged war on each other that ended up in a full-scale neutronic warfare. The Daleks retreated to the safety of their cities, while the Thals remained on the surface, exposed to the radiation causing them to mutate. The Doctor realises that whoever goes back to the TARDIS could be risking their lives. Back in the holding cell, Ian is nearly back on his feet, but they are sl- slowly feeling the increase of the effects of their radiation sickness. The Doctor returns and tells him what he has learned. Ian says that he is the best choice to go, but Susan says that she can go because she is the TARDIS key. She tells Ian that the key needs to be entered correctly, otherwise it will trigger a booby trap to destroy the lock. He says that they will have to go together. The Daleks come and insist that Ian leave now, but he is not recovered enough to make the journey. Susan says that she is afraid to go back by herself, but Ian gives her a pep talk and reassures her that she can do it. Barbara is worried, but Ian says that they have no other choice. In the command room, the Daleks announce that once Susan returns with the drug, they will let the prisoners succumb to the radiation sickness and replicate the drugs for themselves. Susan is making her way back to the TARDIS, but the stormy weather and the effects of the radiation sickness is making it hard going. She falls to the ground and she gets up and appears to recoil from something unseen in front of her, but she manages to evade whatever it is and make it back to the TARDIS. She reclaims the box of drugs and prepares herself to return to the others, who are getting worse by the minute. Episode 3. The Escape Susan exits the TARDIS and immediately encounters a humanoid figure. He tells her not to be afraid and he reveals that he was the one who left the drugs outside the TARDIS and has been observing Susan since their arrival. He introduces himself as Aladon of the Tal people. Susan is taken aback due to the lack of any form of mutation as indicated by the Daleks. From what she tells him about her situation, he believes the Daleks intend to keep the drugs for themselves and so he gives her a second box to hide so she can administer it to the others. He offers to escort her to the city bounds and wonders, if the Daleks consider the Thals to be mutations, then what must they be like? Back in the city, the Daleks let Susan administer the second batch of drugs to the others. They listen in as Susan says that the Thals are starving due to a failure in their harvest and wish to broker a peace with the Daleks so they can trade for food. The Daleks suggest that they feed the prisoners and let them rest in an effort to lure them into a false sense of security so they can trick the Thals. The Daleks summon Susan so they can begin preparations to help the Thals, arousing the suspicion of the others. Back in the TARDIS, more Thals arrive and discuss the plans for the proposed treaty. Their leader comments on the reversal of roles since the war ended, in that the Thals, who were once warriors, have become an agricultural society, and the Daleks, who were philosophers and teachers, have become more scientific and militaristic. Aladon informs them that if the Daleks agree to the treaty, then Susan will sign her name to a note for him. If there is no signature, then they know that the Daleks are not to be trusted. The Daleks dictate their proposals to the Thals, to Susan, and she notices that the Daleks have been spying on their cell. Once she goes back, the prisoners stage an argument so they can knock out the camera observing them. The Daleks note that this was done on purpose, but choose to leave them for the time being. In the cell, the prisoners try to figure out a way to escape. The Doctor says that he has been observing the Daleks, and states that he believes that they have mastered a static electricity generated from the metal floors, which is how they move through the city. They take a cloak that Aladdin gave Susan and formulate an escape plan. Back in the TARDIS, the Tals receive Susan's note and believe everything is alright and that they will receive food and shelter from the Daleks, much to their delight. In the cell, the prisoners have been observing their captors and staged the escape attempt. They blind the Daleks' eye stock with mud from Susan's shoes and push it over onto the cloak, cutting off its connection to the floor. With the Dalek now an operative, Ian and the Doctor open the top of the machine but close it again quickly after seeing what is inside. Clearly disturbed, they tell the women to take, keep a lookout in the hallway. They take whatever was inside the machine out and bundle it up in the cloak. Ian climbs into the now vacant machine and they leave the cell, pretending to be that Ian is the guard. As they leave, they do not notice a tentacle emerging from the cloak on the ground. Episode 4. The Ambush Our heroes make their way down the corridor towards one of the lifts, but come across a sentry. Ian tells the sentry that he has taken them to see the council, but the sentry says that he needs to confirm this. Susan stages a protest to distract the sentry, who helps Ian push them into the lift. After they leave, he confirms the prisoner transfer with the council, only to be told no such orders were given. A lockdown is put in place, and the Daleks begin to cut through the doorway to the lift, which the doctor had earlier sabotaged. Ian is unfortunately trapped in the machine, and they cannot move it as the floor has been become magnetised. He orders the others to leave him behind, which they do. 
They reluctantly obey and they take off in the lift to the top floor, sending it back down for Ian in the hopes that he can get out in time. The Daleks successfully manage to cut through the doorway and immediately blast Ian's machine to pieces. However, it is empty and they notice that the lift is approaching the top floor again. They recall it, but Ian manages to exit before it goes back down. The travellers look out of one of the windows to get their bearings, and Barbara sees the Thals approaching the city, about to walk into an ambush. They attempt to signal the Thals, but it is no use. They notice the lift coming back up and attempt to stop it, but the lift won't respond. Instead, they push a large statue down the lift shaft, destroying the lift and the Dalek inside it. Outside, Alden voices his growing suspicions over the Dalek's intentions, but the Thal leader, Themesis, tells him that his fears are unfounded and this treaty will ensure the survival of their people. Aladdin agrees to follow him, but still cannot shake his sense of unease. It is well founded as we are shown the Daleks turning the food storage room into a kill zone. Back with our heroes, the doctor says that they need to get back to the TARDIS as soon as, as possible, but Susan and Barbara insist that they should stop to help the Thals, as they would be dead without them. Ian says that they are both right, but he says that he will stay behind to warn the Thals while the others go back to the ship. Temesis arrives and makes an impassioned plea to the Daleks for both their peoples to work together. Ian announces that it is a trap, but it is no good, as the Daleks kill Temesis. Ian manages to escape and encounters Aladdin, and together they flee the city. Back at the TARDIS, the Travellers and the Thals discuss their current situation. A party of Thals that have been sent back to recover the body of Temesis return, but some of them have been wounded. The Doctor is going over historical and geographical data with a Thal named Dione. He hopes to use the information to determine Scaros, the name of the planet they are on, location in the universe so that he can plot a course back to Earth. Meanwhile, Ian is talking to Aladdin and another Tal named Ganathus, and says that the Daleks despise anything that is different from them, and there will never be peace between their peoples, and he urges them to stand up to the Daleks. Aladdin refuses, saying that it goes against their way of life. Barbara wonders if their pacifism is instinctual or an adopted way of life. The Doctor sheds some light on the situation and shows them what he has learned from the historical data. It appears that the Tals had in fact mutated as the Daleks said, but hundreds of years ago. Since then, the mutations were bred out of the successive generations of Tals, with the results being the ones that are standing in front of them. The Daleks, who he says were originally named Dals, have yet to achieve the same feat in overcoming their mutations. He also shows them evidence that the Tals were once mighty warriors, and Ian hopes to use the information to spark the urge to fight in the Tals. The Doctor says it is none of their concern now and that they should leave. He asks Ian for the fluid link component, but Ian suddenly re- remembers that he is no longer has it, as the Daleks took it from him when they were captured. Episode 5, The Expedition Back in the city, the Daleks are reviewing surveillance photos of the Travellers and the Tals, and theorise that they move, must be launching some sort of attack against the city. Barbara and Ian get into an argument over the Thals. Ian wants them to fight for themselves, and not just so that they can get into the city to retrieve the fluid link. Barbara says that they have no other choice, as the longer they wait, the more time the Daleks have to find some way out of the city to launch their own attack. The Doctor announces that he has no spares from the component, and ironically, he does require Mercury as well. He also expresses admiration for Barbara's practicality, and that he will find a way to help the Thals to victory. Ian makes them see reason when he asks them how will they explain that the fluid link is worth dying for. Ian again pleads with Aladdin to stand up for themselves, but to no avail. He tries to turn over the Tal's historical information to the Daleks, but that does not seem to rouse them. He tries a different tactic and says that he will take Dione instead so the Daleks can experiment on her in return for handing over the, the fluid link. Aladdin strikes Ian, realising that there are some things that it is okay to fight for. Back in the city, it appears that some Daleks who took the anti-radiation drug seem to be suffering side effects from it and it appears to be fatal. The Dalek Council would make the decision to burn out the cure by increasing the amount of radiation in the area with the detonation of another neutron bomb. They euthanize those heavily affected by the medication and begin preparations for a radiation treatment to see if it will cure those with early symptoms. If it works, they decide that in order for Dalek society to survive and expand, they will need to adapt the environment to suit them and not vice versa. Barbara gets to know more about the area that they are in by conversing with the town named Ganathus, who reveals that there is a way into the rear of the city. However, in order to get there, they need to pass by a swamp that is filled with hostile, mutated creatures. Aladdin appeals to the rest of the Thals, after contemplating his interactions with Ian, to stand up with him and fight the Daleks. They readily agree and come up with a plan to invade the city via the swamp. The Doctor suggests a diversionary attack at the front of the city to draw all attention away from Ian and Barbara's group as they approach the rear of the city. The Daleks are observing the movements of the Thal forces, but get distracted from the reports of the radiation tests come in. It appears to be successful, and they set about preparing their nuclear arsenal. En route through the swamp, 
Gannatus and his brother Antidus argue over the safety of the swamp route. Gannatus says that they have no other choice and tells him not to alarm the others. They camp down for the night and the following morning they see a pipeline feeding water from the swamp into the city. They decide to go around the swamp and enter the city that way. As they are resupplying, one of the Thals is attacked by a creature from the lake and Ian and Gannatus go to investigate. Episode 6 The Ordeal Ian and Gannatus arrive to discover the Thal missing most likely having become a victim of some creature. They have no choice but to proceed towards the city. They reach the cave system where the pipes from the city enter the swamp and split up to explore, with Barbara going with Ganathus. They find a smaller tunnel that leads down, and Ganathus goes to explore, with Barbara staying behind to lower him down via a rope. However, the rope slips from her grasp, but the fall isn't deep enough to hurt Ganathus. Ian and the rest regroup with Barbara, and Ganathus calls up to inform them that there are more tunnels down in the cavern, and that they might lead into the city. Outside the city, the Doctor's group come up with a strategy for how to assault the city. They must first disable the radio and video detection systems in the area in order to gain the upper hand against the less mobile Daleks. Inside the city, the Daleks realise that it will take too long to create a neutron bomb for their exi- from their existing stockpile, and so they will need to find another way to irradiate the plants efficiently. Reports come of Tal activity outside the city, but something is interfering with their surveillance equipment. It is revealed that the Thals are using metal panels to reflect solar rays back to the radio and video towers in the city, effectively jamming the signals and thereby allowing the Doctor, Susan and Aladdin to get into the city. In the caves, Antidus brings Ganatus aside and says that he wants to go back as he is afraid that their mission is futile and he will either die at the hands of the Daleks or die lost in the caves. Ganatus refuses to let him leave and they struggle, causing the roof to cave in and seal off the group from the way that they came in. The cave in alerts the Daleks to the infiltration party, and they continue to track them via vibration sensors and aim to lure them into a trap. The Doctor comes across a junction box that he believes to be a power conduit for the entire city. He tells Aladdin to call off the diversionary attack so as not to cause any unnecessary Tal deaths, and he and Susan sabotage the junction box. Unfortunately, it triggers a fault alarm, and the Doctor and Susan are suddenly surrounded by Daleks. They are brought to the Dalek Council, where they are informed of the plan to irradiate the planet. In the cave, the party reaches a gap in the path. It's too deep to try and climb down and back up again, and so they will have to jump the gap, despite the ledge on the other side being dangerously narrow. Ian volunteers to go first and lands successfully on the far ledge. Ganesis joins him and goes on ahead to secure the next leg of the journey. Ian begins to ferry the others across, using a, a rope to anchor himself, whilst the others tie the opposite end to themselves. Antilus, who seems to be slipping further and further into despair, is the last to make the crossing, and doesn't make the jump and falls into the pit. He nearly drags Ian down with him, but Ian manages to hold on. Antidus calls for help, as Ian's grip is now the only thing keeping the boat alive. Episode 7. The Rescue Ganesis comes to Ian's aid, but Antidus cannot grab onto anything in the chasm to ease the pressure on Ian. With no other choice, he cuts the rope, sacrificing himself to save Ian. Ganesis is distraught, but Ian tries to bolster his feelings that Antidus' sacrifice was not in vain. Ganatus reveals that Antinous wanted to turn back, but he forced him to continue. With no way forward, they decide to go back when their torch battery dies. However, they notice a, sh- a shaft of light coming from the rocks just overhead and break through them, thus finding a way into the city. Back in the city, the Doctor berates the Daleks for their plans, but they refuse to change their mind and begins preparations to start filtering radiation out of the city. In an effort to avert the impending genocide, the Doctor offers to show them the secrets of the TARDIS. However, they intend to carry on with their plans, trusting that their own scientific acumen will allow them to understand the workings of the TARDIS without the Doctor's help. Suddenly, reports arrive of a TAL attack at the edge of the city. The infiltration party makes their way through the city, trying to locate the control room whilst avoiding the Dalek sentries. However, they are noticed by a security camera before Ian can destroy it. They encounter Aladdin, who informs them that the Doctor and Susan have been captured. They resolve to knock out the control room and then rescue the others. Before they can do that, an alert goes through the city recalling all Daleks to a safe zone before irradiation is filtered out. They begin sealing off all the sections of the city, leading Ian and Barbara's group in a race against time to avoid being sealed off. They barely make it through and discover that the control room as they discover the control room as well as the Doctor and Susan. They interrupt the countdown for the radiation and a battle between the Daleks and the Tals and our heroes begins. During the fighting, a console that powers the static emitters that allow the Daleks to move is destroyed, incapacitating them. The Dalek commander pleads for mercy, but the Doctor refuses, knowing that they will most likely die as they can no longer power the radiation emitters that will counteract the anti-radiation drug. The wounded are seen to, while the Doctor and Ian go and make sure that there are no radiation leaks. Ganatus wonders if the cost of victory was too high, despite Susan's highlighting the reward of the food technology which they now have access to. Back in the TARDIS, the 
Tiles ask the Doctor to stay and help them, but he says that they cannot, as the Tiles need to learn how to progress as a society on their own. The others say goodbye to their Tile friends and then leave in the TARDIS. As they are flying through the void, an explosion rocks the TARDIS. Massive kudos for the very long recap. That must have been very difficult. Now that that's the story recap out of the way, we're going to discuss some trivia notes with Trisha. Over to you, Trish. Thanks. So, an interesting thing, we have been referring to the story as the Daleks, and we will continue to refer to it as the Daleks going forward. However, the production team's final name for this serial at the time of broadcast was actually the Mutants, but it's now referred to as the Daleks to prevent confusion with the third Doctor story, The Mutants. The Daleks aired from December 21st, 1963 to February 1st, 1964. And there were two directors for this story. First, we had Christopher Barry, who directed episodes 1, 2, 4, and 5. And then we had Richard Martin, who directed episodes 3, 6, and 7. This was just due to scheduling conflicts with one of them being able to do the entire show. Both of these men would return to Doctor Who later on. So Christopher Barry was quite an accomplished Doctor Who director. He directed nine more stories, as well as Downtime, the Doctor Who spin-off movie that was released in 1995. His stories include The Rescue, The Romans, The Savages, The Power of the Daleks, The Demons, the aforementioned The Mutants, Robot, The Brain of Morbius, and The Creature from the Pit. He died in 2014 following an escalator fall in a shopping centre. Richard Martin also directed more Doctor Who stories, as I mentioned. He directed the first episode of next week's story, The Edge of Destruction. He also directed The Web Planet, The Dalek Invasion of Earth, and The Chase. Apparently it was Richard who convinced Variety Lambert that the Daleks should be approached in a less conservative manner than what they'd originally planned. This story was written by Terry Nation, and what a legacy Terry Nation has left in Doctor Who by creating probably the most recognisable villain of the entire franchise. Also, the most marketable in terms of toys. Terry Nation did own the copyright to the Daleks, so he made quite a chunk of change off of them. In total, he himself wrote 11 stories for Doctor Who, nine of which were Dalek stories, including this one, The Dalek Invasion of Earth, The Chase, Mission to the Unknown, The Dalek's Master Plan, Planet of the Daleks, Genesis of the Daleks, and Destiny of the Daleks. He also wrote two non-Dalek stories, those being The Keys of Marinus and The Android Invasion. Nation once claimed that he came up with the name Dalek after seeing a set of encyclopedias, with one volume spanning from D-A-L, and then the next volume being L-E-K. He later admitted, though, that he made that up for the press, and it was just a name he came up with. The comparison people make between the Daleks and the Nazis is not a coincidence. One did inspire the other, and Terry Nation was very honest about that. It was actually producer Verity Lambert who extended this story from six episodes to seven, because she was so impressed with the story that Terry had written and she wanted to give it more time to be expanded upon. Terry Nation also created two other popular series for BBC, Survivors and Blake Seven. I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about Terry in future episodes, as he's done quite a lot for the franchise. There are four Dalek operators that we don't see in this story. Uh, Robert Jewell, Kevin Manser, Michael Somerton and Gerald Taylor. They were chosen because of their small stature but muscular ability to move around the Daleks. The Dalek voices weren't provided by the guys inside the Dalek itself. There were two actors who did the voices, Peter Hawkins, Dalek 1, and David Graham, Dalek 2. The serial was later adapted into a film, Doctor Who and the Daleks, which had a completely different cast though the character names were the same. Bands of sticky tape had to be affixed to the quote-unquote shoulder section of the Daleks, so I imagine where the bobbly bits end and the rings begin, after William Hartnell actually caught himself on one of the metal bands. Jesus. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, looking at them, they are just bits of metal stuck together, so apparently they weren't as careful as they should have been, so they ended up adding that extra tape. 
There were some changes made from the original script. I'm going to screw this up massively now because a lot of it resolves around the names of the Thals. So, Temesis was originally named Stoll. Aladon was originally named Van. Ganatus was originally named Kurt. Christus was originally named Zal. Antidus was originally named Ven. And Elion was originally named Zor. Why those names were changed, I have no clue. I feel really badly for Galatus because like all these other like alien names and then just Kurt in the middle. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know what they were going for. I don't know whether they wanted to go for a more like Greek god feel, maybe. Yeah, I get that impression. Yeah. In the original script, the dangers facing Ian Barber and the Thals in the mountains were actually a bit different from what we saw in the final version. Originally, there was meant to be mutated spiders and a fiery gas fissure. Instead, we got the pool with the thing that ate someone and the giant gap. Yeah. In the original script, the Doctor and Susan were sentenced to be executed in a sonic chamber. That could have been interesting. Yeah. And also, there was a whole thing made about a forthcoming great rain, so a rainstorm that was meant to be coming, which would reduce the radiation levels enough for the Daleks to leave the city. But that was never mentioned in the final version, and they just decided to let it go. Our guest actors for this include Alan Wheatley as Temesis. He was a prolific actor in the 30, from the 30s to the 60s, but he's perhaps best remembered as playing the Sheriff of Nottingham in the 1950s TV series The Adventures of Robin Hood. We had John Lee as Aladon, Marcus Hammond as Antidus, Virginia Wether- Wetherill, I think that's how you pronounce her name, as Diane, Philip Bond as Ganatus. None of these actors appear again in Doctor Who in the future. You always get the impression like that... Um some of these people like they'll they do appear back in the show again and i was convinced that the guy that plays aladon actually appears in like some patrick trotton stories but it's someone who looks suspiciously like him yeah it's probably the one thing that i was a bit surprised when doing the trivia for this episode is i'm used to seeing you know such and such also appeared in another doctor who but for some this this episode no none of the files appear again For our main cast review this week, we will look at Carol Ann Ford, who plays Susan. So Carol Ann was born in 1940, on the 16th of June, which would have made her 23 when she started playing the 15-year-old Susan. She appeared in her first film, The Last Load, when she was only eight. So she started acting when she was quite young. Anyone who doesn't know her from Doctor Who may know her from the 1962 film adaptation of The Day of the Triffids, where she played Bettina. According to an article Caroline wrote for The Telegraph, Susan was originally intended to be a character with telepathic abilities, as well as the skills to fly the TARDIS. But in the series, she was made far more ordinary. This would explain a bit about the way she was portrayed in the original studio recording. Caroline Ford remained close friends with William Hartnell after leaving Doctor Who and was reportedly devastated by his death in 1975. She stopped acting following an illness in 1977, which led to a dramatic weight reduction and the loss of her voice for a time, though she did gradually return to acting as she improved. She did appear in an independently produced Doctor Who spin-off movie, which I had never heard of, called Shakedown, Return of the Santarans, where she played a character called Zorel. She has returned to the character of Susan in recent years through the wonder that is Big Finish Productions. This is actually, like, her coming back to Shakedown isn't actually the first time that a, a long-standing companion would have returned to the show or to the universe of Doctor Who in some way, shape, or form as a different character. Mm. Yeah, so it, it's it's always nice to see that some of the original people come back for just, like, even just to help out in the story. Yeah, I'd never heard of Shakedown before, which is weird because I've heard a lot of the other random spin-off movies, but never heard of that one. Yeah, like, I, I've never heard of it either. I don't know if it's available to buy on DVD. When I looked it up, the only thing listed was VHS, so... I'm pretty sure someone out there has done the world a favour and put transferred it onto DVD or some sort of digital uh, content. (laughs) Maybe. Hopefully it won't be like the Star Wars Holiday Special where only some people have ever seen it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
so thanks very much for those trivia notes, Trish. They're like always really interesting, and it's always really cool to see what uh, characters that appear in the show uh, appear in later on in life, be it who or something else. And speaking of characters, what we're actually going to do now is we're going to discuss the characters in the story. So let's start off with the man himself, I suppose, the Doctor. I think in this story, we see the many, many sides of the Doctor. But the one that causes the most harm, I think, is just how self-centred he is. Yeah. We've talked through previous episodes how in the Honoured Pilot, he was kind of the villain. And then in the version of an earthly child that went to air, he was kind of mischievous. Here, he's just a bit of a self-centred trickster. Do you know, he sort of reminds you of that trickster god who's playing with things to get what he wants. That's a polite way of putting it. <laughs> what was your way of putting it? I put him down that he was a bit of a selfish bollocks because... Uh, that, that is also a good way of putting it. Yeah, because his thing of, I, wa- I really want to go investigate, but Ian, Barbara and Susan present him with logic, at which point he's like, well, like, well screw your logic, I'm it's my way or the highway. It's one of these things, is that he is clearly very self-centred. And he doesn't particularly care, particularly about Ian and Barbara. And he knows that Susan only wants to leave because Ian and Barbara want to leave. If Ian and Barbara weren't there, he and Susan would be off doing what they normally do. So he's kind of like, eh, that's fine, don't worry about it. Yeah. So he tricks them, he endangers all of them. But similar to in An Unearthly Child, when the shit hits the fan, he comes clean straight away. And makes no qualms about it. And is like, I tricked you. I wanted to see the city. And he's very frank about it. Yeah. Which is, I don't know if it's a redeeming quality, but it's a slightly positive quality on him being a total bollocks, like you said. He's also got a a pretty lousy poker face as well, like, because, like, you know, he goes, oh, this thing which uh, we need, yeah, is it working? Maybe there's some component of it that can help us outside, at which point you just like going, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like there's nothing they can do. They can't fix it. And Susan clearly, and this kind of goes off from what I was saying in the trivia bit about the way Susan was meant to be versus the way she's portrayed. I get the sense that she only knows about the TARDIS the bits he's shown her. So she doesn't know that he's lying. Yeah. She knows that he's after doing something to make them explore the city, but not that it could easily be fixed by just plugging it back in. One of the things as well that came across, it's a, it's a good carryover from our discussion around an unearthly child, is his line when they're talking about the Thals and worrying about the Thals and their issue with the Daleks. And he says, we have ourselves to worry about. Yeah. And through these first two two stories, that's a thread with him. And the we seems to be a fluid term. Sometimes we are we, the TARDIS crew. Other times when we see it in this story, we is him and Susan. You know, Barbara's lost. He realizes that his granddaughter is being exposed to radiation. And it's like, you can go look for Barbara if you want, but I'm getting Susan back to the TARDIS. Yeah. It's a sort of, you, you can imagine like that, what it, like someday like he'll go... We, we all have to work together. And then maybe Ian might go, come on, we all have to work together. At which point the doctor would just go, we? What we? There is no we here. Yeah. And like, he ends up being, when they realise that they need to go back for the fluid link, he then is suddenly all about we, because we includes the Thals when it comes to the mission to get back the fluid link. Yeah. And he is 100% behind getting the Thals involved in that. Whereas before he didn't care about them. Yeah. And it's kind of using them as a means to an end yeah and then towards the end though and again it's one of these things where these first two stories you really run the gamut of the doctor's personality is at the end he's very cheerful very lovable he's talking to the thals he's you know explaining to them about how they need to grow and learn by themselves. And he's clearly getting along really well with them. He mentions that he was a pioneer amongst his own people, which I hope we hear more about at a later stage. But you're like, you were such an asshole earlier. 
Yeah. And then once he realized that they documented their history, and then obviously once they got to the end of the story and he knew he was leaving, suddenly they're his best friends. I'm like... But but that's like uh, when uh, Barbara as well, like, you know, is like also like him trying to get the towels to, you know, get involved in the fight. And he's like, you know, I... Uh, my, I must say, my dear, I must change my attitude about you or my opinion of you. Meanwhile, still not being humble enough to admit that he was a prick to her at the start of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's just... It, it's I, I don't know whether I can say I like the Doctor in this story. I like bits of him, but he's certainly interesting. Yeah, it's... Like, w- one thing that... For anyone that's looking to kind of do what we did, we just start off at the start and work their way up. This story as well as An Unearthly Child and next week's one, An Edge of Destruction. It's it's a trilogy for which you get to know these characters inside and out. And this is definitely part two of that story in the sense of, okay, we've got a bit more progression in terms of his character growth or what he's all about, but we still haven't seen everything yet. So again, some really good work. It was well here by William Hartnell because he gave us our first taste of the fury of uh, a Time Lord or or his people when the Daleks are begging him for help and he just says even if I wanted to I wouldn't know how so it's like these the, these people which you know or like these creatures are begging for his pity and he's like no yeah I, I th- and he gets it across sorry but he gets it across in such like a stern commanding way that whatever you feel about the Doctor in this story Hartnell's acting is fantastic oh it really is and I just had a flash there while you were speaking to um, the end of episode 2 when the Doctor and Ian are removing the Dalek from the casing Yeah, and you can tell that again that caring side of him kind of comes out because he immediately silently agrees with Ian send Barbara and Susan out of the room yeah immediately Mm -hmm. so there is again that level of compassion is there so it's it's, oh i don't i don't know i think i think if you were watching this when it aired and you watched each episode and like you'd watched starting with an unearthly child up to now there were probably people across the uk who they liked different things about him yeah Some people like his compassion. Some people like his intelligence. Some people like that he's this sort of trickster, godlike entity playing with everyone. I don't know which one of them I like the most. (laughs) Um, Yeah, no, I I agree with you. All right, is like that when he has that like mischievous giggle when things go his way. It's like you just can't help but like kind of go, "Oh, you." So moving on from him, the next member of our crew is Susan. Yes. What do you think of her development in this episode? So, what? Yeah, one thing that I suppose, kind of what we touched on last week, you do get to see an awful lot more of her act like a child. It, not, not in a sort of like a temper tantrum way, but in the sense of when she's the only option to go back to the TARDIS, and the, the camera work, again, is stellar uh, to kind of get across how terrified she is and about the camera work and Caroline Ford's acting like you really just want to pick her up and hug her and tell her everything's going to be all right she's like and I think she's kind of adopted Ian and Barbara as like not quite parents but maybe an aunt and an uncle or something like that because her bond with them is definitely veering more to the familial side of things and when she's with them she's obviously stronger and braver but when she's away from them like you said last week about her being away from the doctor that she kind of goes to pieces a small bit and now that she has three adult role models maybe now we get to see what like her growth will be like will be a bit more interesting i think yeah i think we're definitely seeing more of her childish behavior coming out when she's outside of her comfort zone and you get to see Again, the fact that she's just a kid. Yeah. But, you know, she's not a little, little kid, but she's still a kid. Hmm. Um, one of the things that really highlighted that for me, those two actually, the first was when she finds the first plant and she's so excited because it's perfectly 
preserved and it looks so beautiful and then she shows it to Ian and it's sort of like oh my god look what I found and then obviously Barbara sees the weird thing that I've forgotten the name of um, and she calls for Ian and Ian panics and accidentally destroys the plant Yeah, and she gets this look of utter devastation yeah. on her face and you're sort of half expecting her to hold a grudge against him, like a childish grudge, or to get in a bit of a tantrum about it. She doesn't, which is great. But again, it's that childish behavior and that childish mentality coming through. And the second time is when the doctor doesn't believe her that there was someone outside. And so she goes and she sulks in a corner because no one believes her because she's the little kid or whatever. Do you know what I mean? I think it was a really good way of seeing that just because she travels in time and space doesn't mean that she's a grown-up. Yeah. At least not yet. One thing I did find is that, and again, this all ties, it's such a good development for her because it all ties in together, is she's very trusting. Yes. A, she's very trusting of the Thals as soon as she meets him because the sense I got was that to her, he looked like a god. This sort of Adonis type physique. But when she gets back, even though she knows the Daleks found the extra set of radiation meds, yeah, she knows they're being captive. She still has no qualms about telling the others everything she knows about the Thals and what they want without even considering the possibility that the Daleks are listening in. <laughs> yeah. And even when she does realise that they were listening in, she treats it as a bit of a joke and still continues to trust that they're being honest. And I'm just like, oh, like, this is like the beginning of this journey. And you're like, you've never really been captured before, have you? <laughs> yeah. not, not in this, not in this way. <laughs> you know, obviously there was the previous storyline they were captured, but like, this isn't a common occurrence for you, which coming from New Who, you're like, you know, why would you do that? You assume they're listening, but you know, this never happens to her so she didn't assume they were listening and she didn't assume that they were evil or malicious yeah it's like it's almost um do you know it kind of reminds me of, reminds me of pinocchio a small bit when he goes off with like the, those two foxes and it's like they, clearly these guys are up to no good but pinocchio's like cool i'll go where you, where you want me to go oh my god that's actually a really good analogy for susan yeah she's kind of like pinocchio <laughs> and that the more we see the stories envelop the more the real girl kind of shows yeah, like that's the thing, because you're, you're, you're first treated to her and it's like going, right, she's clearly an alien of some description, but the layer of mystique is completely stripped away by the fact that, oh, wait, you're just a child, regardless of your alienness, you're still a child. Yeah. The last thing that I really liked about Susan in this episode was when we had the sort of line in the sand and you'd Barbara and the Doctor on one side, Susan sided with Ian. Yes. About the Thals being involved. And I kind of get this sense that for her, the idea of someone dying for her and for her benefit alone, as in that they wouldn't get anything for themselves, was incredibly upsetting, as it would be to a 15 year old. You know, we kind of don't expect her to go against her grandfather on this because it's to get what they need to leave but I think had the Thals agreed purely for the fluid link and that was the only thing they were agreeing on the basis of and had Susan seen what's his name Gannis's brother like fall down that pit yeah I think it may have broken her a little bit so we're very lucky that she wasn't part of that uh, uh, infiltration party. Yes. Yes, we are. And I suppose speaking so, of the infiltration party, uh, Ian and Barbara. Yes. Um, how about we do Mr. Chesterton first? I have down here Ian Chesterton, man of action. I have Ian Chesterton more than meets the eye, so he's a Transformer. No, so how about you go down first with your man of action? Cool. So what I saw in this story is, again, perfect build-off of last story, is Ian really taking on the role of protector. He realises that 
he is the young strong man and feels that that is that that makes him responsible for making sure everyone is safe particularly susan and barbara he's not only the first to volunteer to do something so to stay behind to warn the falls or to go on the mission through the mountains but he just assumes that he would be the one to face the challenge when they talk about going back to the tardis to getting the radiation meds yeah. It didn't even enter his mind that it would be someone other than him who would go. And I don't think he does that because he thinks either of the women are incapable. It's just that, obviously, the way he was brought up and the world he comes from, he should be the one as the man to put himself in danger yeah. and to protect them. And like it's, and as you said, like it's not as a sort of... Um... Not, like, don't want to jump the gun too much, like, but not sort of like a Harry Sullivan type thing where it's like, you know... Oh, old girl all that type of stuff it's like look if we're if something is to be done i'm probably the best choice to do it and i don't want to put anyone at any undue risk yeah exactly and again like it's not that he doesn't see susan or barbara as capable you know we see it in the pep talk that he gives to susan yeah that he believes in her and we see it when Ganatus asks him, like, oh, I'm surprised you let Barbara come with us through the mountains. And he's like, as if I would have been able to stop her. Yeah, pretty much. He recognises their strengths. He just, where he can, wants to protect them, which I think is a, a lovely, a lovely piece of him. Yeah. And one thing. Yeah. yeah go on. No, no, you go first. I was going to say that one thing that is interesting as well is. This is the first time we see Ian and Barbara really disagree. Yes. And that conversation between them, because they they had been a team, just the two of them, up until this point. Mm-hmm. They were part of the bigger team, but they were like team Ian and Barbara. Yeah. And so for them to disagree so fundamentally was like, oh my God, like what's this going to do to their dynamic? But what I love is that they disagreed but he still respects her. And then, like I said later on, he has that line with Ganatus where he's like, as if I could have stopped her. Yeah. And it's actually his disagreement uh, is the point that I was just going to make there that it's what I was about more and more than meets the eye is usually you see in, again, other forms of like science fiction where our gateway character, like so our mod- our art human is brought to an alien society, or even if they're sent back into the past or whatever, and they lead the locals in their fight. This is a case of where Ian is, he wants to get the Tals only to fight, but only to fight for themselves. And he doesn't want to lead them. He just wants to make them see that they have these capabilities themselves. So that's why like you know, he knows that Aladdin is the clear leader, and he's not trying to subvert that or anything like that he basically makes Aladdin realize that about himself uh the same way he makes the Tals realize that there is something worth fighting for and I really like that about Ian he doesn't try and call the shots he just tries to make everyone see their worth and their own capabilities yeah and we get to see him try to develop himself as well at the beginning he wants to learn and understand how the TARDIS works yeah he's a scientist at the end of the day and he wants to understand. And it's unfortunate that the doctor fobs him off. Yeah. But I like that they're continuing that vein of him wanting to understand and learn more. Because that is a core part of who he is. And that's, again, as I said previously, it's why Ian's one of my favourite characters. Is that he's got so many layers and so much about him. That coming into this, when you initially first see him, you know, he's that charismatic uh, science teacher that you think, all right, he's just going to be the um, the eye candy as such. But it's not like there's actually a whole lot to him and it's great. The other side of the Ian and Barbara conversation then is Barbara herself. I'll let you take this one. So my first note was Barbara Wright, Wonder Woman, because I absolutely love Barbara in this story. Yes, the one of the most famous kind of stills from... The production for this is Barbara in the hallway recoiling in fear at the oncoming Dalek. That's about as much of the screaming heroine as we get from Barbara in this because she's right there beside the Doctor urging for the Tals 
the, for the use of to get the towels to get involved in this fight so that they can get their fluid link home. She like she kind of calls Ian and Doctor out on uh, the Doctor out and their thing going like you're just was it min- mincing with words. She like she's clearly a woman of action in this as well because like, like, she's even involved in the final fight. Like she's like throwing shit at that. Like, she's throwing stuff at Daleks and she's not afraid to get stuck in. Like she's also the one that helps kind of come up with the the escape plan because she like makes the mud from Susan Shoe and she's the one that goes right in front of the Dalek to slap it on the eye stalk. So she she really is a woman of action in this and she's very principled as well. And there's also that kind of you get those few fleeting moments of potential romance between herself and Ganatus, but she doesn't kind of cater more to it than like the simple flirtation. Because like she she wants to go home at the end of the day, and she just that's pretty much it. Yeah, I think this is a very strong story for Barbara. While we got to see her compassion in the previous story, we didn't really get to see much of her. She was kind of letting Ian take the lead a little bit, whereas in this story, I think she really comes into her own. At the beginning. There is devastation there when she realizes that they haven't gone home and she's terrified that they won't be able to, which is completely understandable. Yeah. Um, but the point is she still goes on and she tries to overcome it. She doesn't leave all the thinking to the others, which again, like you said, the mud was her idea and being the one to go after the ice stock, I mean, that takes a bit of balls. Like, Yeah. <laughs> Just like, what more can you say about Barbara other than the fact that she is absolutely awesome in this story? Yeah. Her sliding with the Doctor instead of Ian was a bit surprising because we're used to seeing her compassion up until this point. Mm. And this seems like it sort of goes in the face of that. But A, she's human, therefore she's allowed to have flaws. Yes. And B, the bit that I found so sort of indicative of it was that she kind of called bullshit on Ian's reason. Because he was like, I don't want anyone to die for me to get back this fluid link. Yeah. And she's like, except for us, though. You don't mind if we die. And it's kind of, the way she says it, you're like, ooh. Is that a bit of an overstep? But you can tell where she's coming from. She's like, we need to leave. What what exactly do you expect us to do? They can help us. We can have more men helping us. Why why is this a problem for you? And like as you said, like she is human, like, so she has a limit. And like we, the one thing that we haven't seen fully explained out was the length of time that took place in an unearthly child up until when she has this uh, argument with Ian, like. I think it's what maybe like seventy-two hours, to, like real time altogether. Yeah, about that. There's been no break. They they, they haven't had, they, they haven't had like just like a, a simple solitary moment because they went from a life or death scenario with cavemen attempting to use them for caveman politics, then they came to an irradiated planet, of which they immediately started suffering radiation poisoning, and then they were captors of like this genocidal. Rob, mutated robotic civilization they haven't had a whole lot of time like to kind of put the feet up as such yeah and it's like like I said her being like no we should get the Thales to help us is surprising because of her compassion but we do see her compassion earlier on in the story do you know when the doctor is getting sicker quicker than the rest of them she does take care of him and Ian is like oh don't you wish sometimes that he kind of he deserves it and she's like yeah but Still going to take care of him, though. My final note on Barbara, um, because I'll talk about her thing with Ganatus when we talk about the Thals, but my final note on Barbara, she looks really good in the Thal leather pants and sandals. Yeah. It was practical, but stylish. Yeah. Like, that that is, like, such a kind of, like, you know, the warrior woman thing of kind of going, "Uh, this isn't good. You have practical uh, clothing. Let me take it. Also, is it maybe some sort of metaphor for I'm wearing the pants in this scenario? <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Although, can you imagine her trying to make that jump in her skirt? Yeah. That would have been... That I hope. So that leads us over to the Thals. 
I'm going to start off on this one because I had one word to describe the Thals. Cool. Boring. Yeah. I found them so incredibly boring. With the exception of Ganatus flirting with Barbara. Yeah. Like, Ganatus and Aladdin a small bit, I like. Because... Like just Aladdin, like seems like like a rebel within his own society in the sense of like that he is like Temesis seems to kind of fob off his concerns. It's like ah, oh, it's all gravy. They come across more like a hippie commune than anything. Yeah, but like one of the things that I found boring about them was is that the fact that they're pacifists. Because I think that was interesting. Though we didn't really get into enough of that. I think yeah, we didn't have them explaining why they became pacifists. As much as I would have liked. But like at the beginning, when when we first meet the Tals as a group, so when the others arrive at the TARDIS to meet with Aladdin, you get the sense that, do they have some weird thing about women in their culture? Because they laugh at Diony for not having an opinion. As if, well, why would she have an opinion? And I'm like, what? What's that about? And they never mentioned it really ever again, except from again that one line from Ganatus being like, "Oh, I'm surprised you let Barbara come with you." And I was like, "Are are we meant to see them as a culture that doesn't respect women, or do they respect?" I, I'm confused. Well, I have a feeling that given the fact that they've regressed to it, like an agricultural society, has it gone to the scenario where it's like women are homemakers, and therefore like they shouldn't, like not that they shouldn't, but their opinions in governmental matters don't really aren't expected maybe it's just i think so much time was given to developing the daleks yeah which we'll discuss in a minute that i just found the tiles boring by comparison like i said the only one i find interesting is ganatus because he does not hide his flirtation with barbara at all no at one point, he falls asleep with his head resting near her ass, sort of curled up on her legs. He holds her hand the whole time and, like, guides her through everything. And, of course, like, the little kiss at the end. Like, yeah. I'm going to give a spoiler for some people in terms of my opinions in upcoming episodes. I will ship Ian and Barbara to the core. You can fight me. I don't care. Right, I love the two of them, and I did from the very first time I saw them on screen. However, Ganatus and Barbara are kind of cute. Yeah, it's kind of adorable. It, it is, um, and it's like Ganatus is clearly the ladies' man of the of the group of the the Tal Society. Yeah, and at the start, when he started like flirting with her, when we see them together, I thought that maybe she didn't reciprocate, but then I sort of looked at looked at it again as the episodes were were unfurling and I was like hold on Barbara's a strong somewhat independent woman she wouldn't hold his hand if she didn't want to yeah and then I kind of saw her flirting back with him I was like okay you're adorable I'm glad that like Barbara left and moved on but like that that for me was the only redeeming part of that part of the story that was cute to watch the Tals are also guilty of of another small pet peeve of mine uh, is that when it comes to science fiction, societies that are dressed the exact same, <laughs> y- uniformed clothing, haircuts, the whole lot, I, I hate it. I can't stand it. It just, oh God, it bothers me so much. Also, for a society that, you know, has to worry about food supplies, that, you know, are aware of mutations from the nuclear fallout, those women have zero boob support for running. Like, zero. It's completely open. You're like, that's just going to hurt when you try to run anywhere. And as well for, like, an agricultural society, they're very, like, I think maybe they should have uh, cast actors that weren't as soft-looking, if you catch my meaning. (laughs) Yeah, you sort of get the the sense that none of these people have done a hard day's work in their life. No. Those stupid um, spacesuits. Oh, God. The one other line I love as well, and going back to the Ganatus and Barbara thing, because again, they're the only thing I liked about the Thals, was his line, you know, do you always do what Ian tells you? <laughs> you know, clearly trying to be like, 
are they are they a thing yeah do i ha-? and then when she's like no and he's suddenly like yeah <laughs> i'm I, I, i'm in here i'm in <laughs> yeah um so like what was there anything other redeeming qualities you've had about the thals well see that was the thing like i only really liked aladdin and ganesis like the rest of the time like antidus like i i don't know what more could be said about him he actually no, i think i suppose what's gonna be said about him like he's that despairing character in the group like he's the the negative nelly if you want to kind of give it some sort of moniker Dione is just there to, I suppose, maybe be the token female in the group. Temesis comes across as a really ineffectual leader. So yeah, the, only Ganesis and Aladdin are there, and the rest of the society, they're just... Uh, it's like I was in Hot Shots. Who's that? It's like, oh, the, she's CIA. The other man's an extra. It's just They're just there to fill the scene. Yeah. And they're a massive contradiction in terms of development when you compare them to our villain of this story which is the Daleks so before we get into the Daleks I think we should uh, address the elephant in the room what the hell is a doll (laughs) no I was going with the fact that okay it's a studded wheelie bin with a whisk and plunger arms (laughs) or what what was it a pepper pot is the the (laughs) yeah yeah no I I'll be honest right so I wanted to go into this episode being a bit critical right because the daleks are probably the doctor who villain yes like even my mum knows what a dalek is yeah right and i wanted to be i didn't want to just love the story because it's the first dalek story i wanted to look at it from a side critical eye and i think the daleks in this episode actually look quite good they move quite fluidly they clearly mastered that whole movement of a very awkward thing but they look quite good and in some ways they look better than they do in color big time Uh, monochrome there's a lot to be said for monochrome when it comes when it's come to an antagonistic side of things as opposed to the protagonists and like here you like the show the fact that the show is in black and white adds what I thought were like the the following like really strong things about the Daleks, the the facelessness of them, the mm-hmm. like so just like overall design, it's just so eerie. Uh, but like, there's some of their other like really strong points that I put down is the fact that look, whatever jokes you want to make about the the look of the Dalek and what they're, if it was like, yeah, like it's a little pepper pot or whatever the case is, they're genocidal. They have only real circumstantial weaknesses, like so if they're not touching the the metal floor, and they have a massive superiority complex, and they actually have the armaments and technology to back up that complex, so they are terrifying. Yeah, like I think um, having the Daleks appear as reoccurring villains throughout all of Doctor Who is a lot better than having. Like a villain race of the week, uh, yeah, villain race of the week that has the same shtick, like you know, as like you know, like the Cybermen, the other kind of big bads. They're not that same genocidal thing. They're like Doctor Who's version of the Borg, but it's not how. But it's a case of like the Daleks want to eradicate all life to prove their superiority, whereas the Cybermen want to upgrade. Everyone will we'll get Cybermen later on, but I, I've, I've always liked the Daleks, and whether they're used good or bad. They're being used for a reason. And this episode goes to show what that reason is. Yeah, and what I like about this episode, coming back to it. So again, I think I first watched this episode, God, nine or ten years ago? Would have been? It was when we were still in college, so about yeah. ten years ago. The thing that struck me then, and it struck me again when I watched it the other night, was they didn't kill Ian when Ian went to escape. And that kind of goes, it kind of flies in the face of what people think of with the Daleks as the ultimate killing machine. They're very devious. Yes. They thought that Ian and Barbara and the Doctor and Susan were Thals and they needed information from them. They could have killed Ian quite easily, but they chose not to. And if you think about it from a scientific 
perspective. And bear in mind that we're told that they were scientists. They have four specimens. Yeah. Two male, two female. One elderly male, one young male. You don't get rid of one of your specimens until you've learned all you can from them. Yeah. And that, to me, I remember when I first watched this years and years ago, I was like, oh my god, why didn't they just kill him? Like, that's what Daleks do, like, exterminate and all that kind of thing. But it shows that there's a level of intelligence there. They're not mindless killing machines. They have a plan. And we see that throughout the first, like, four episodes. They keep the humans alive. They allow them to have the radiation meds, even though they found a second box. They allowed them to have them because they were getting information. They were controlling the situation. As soon as they lost control of the situation, though, like the minute they escaped the cell, the dog's like, okay, it's all this is off the table. Exterminate them. We don't care anymore. We got what we wanted. The thals are coming to us. I, I don't care about these anymore. And suddenly they're a non-issue. Even though the Daleks know that they're not actually Thals. They don't care about them anymore. And even with the Thals, they there's no personal vendetta. It's, they're not us. So they have to go away. There's nothing personal there. They just want them gone. They're like a pest. Yeah. More than anything else. And I can completely get why people latched onto that so much. Like the original viewing figures for the first two episodes of the story were quite good, but by the third episode, word of the Daleks had kind of spread around the general population. And I think they saw like close to a 50% increase in their viewing figure for episode three. They are um, like, they're eye catching. And as and you said, like the reason that there was such a huge jump is because Look, these things are legitimate. Like they, they do come across as legitimate, and whatever way, like you know, people want to you know mock them or whatever. Like you're mocking them because they've lasted for fifty plus years. Yeah, and I am going to make one jumping the timeline comment. I know I shouldn't, but I am because it's going to take us years to get to the episode I'm about to mention. What I love is in this very first episode that has the Daleks, it is established off the bat that they are a biological entity within a mechanical casing. Yes. And people will know what I'm hinting at in New Who, but that is set in stone from Terry's first script. Yeah. They are a biological entity in, we may call it maybe a travel machine. That gets them around. Yes. The Dalek is not the casing. The Dalek is the thing inside it. It's a very aggressive wheelchair market. (laughs) Indeed. So the first episode we have with the Daleks... One of the Doctor's most fiercest villains. Paddy, what did you think of the story as a whole? Cool. So, uh, once again, out of our rating system, out of five, I have given this a four. I, no, it's seven episodes, yes. But for me, I wasn't really bored as such. Uh, I guess such. Oh, no, I wasn't really bored because I think it gave really good character development for everyone. Uh, it really got across the Daleks for how... Uh, sinister, sneaky, um, how to, just capable they are because, look, it was a case of we need to be able to expand. We don't have the ability to launch that full-scale bomb that we wanted, but how about we just irradiate the entire planet and that way we, we come out on tops. Like, so, from a character standpoint of view, an introduction of a villain that would go on to be a recurring villain, I loved it. Some of the effects... I really enjoyed. Like I'm a huge sucker for the Daleks. Uh, Kill Ray. The, like when it when it turns the entire screen negative, it really gets and like the reaction of the actors, you get the impression that the pain that they feel when they're shot is absolutely excruciating. And some recurring villains have like very similar effects to their weaponry, 
but I think having that like faith to negative component really gets across more so than if they just after went ah and put, had a sore face on him. The Tals, as we said, like for the most part, with the exception of Aladdin and Ganethus for me, they're fairly meh. They are guilty of my cardinal sin of complete uniform uh, uniformity in the clothing styles of like their society. I hate it. But um, and like the final fight. I know that they had a budget and I know that they had extras like or a limited pool of extras, but to go from the really good fight that we had on an earthly child to this one, it just seemed a small bit of a cluster and a bit all over the place and I don't think it was as good as it could have been. Uh, so that's where it kind of loses the points for me. But overall, I really enjoyed the story. How about you? So this is our second story in a row where you and I have a one point difference in our scoring mechanism so i gave this story a three and i'll explain why so the first four episodes i think were great they were well paced they had good cliffhangers we had good character interactions and the introduction of the daleks like that freeze frame with barbara at the end is just amazing as well i completely agree with you um what the actors would later come to sort of call like posneg posneg whenever a dalek would kill someone looks really really effective particularly when you consider that like they couldn't do a ray gun or anything like that coming from the dalek because of budgetary reasons so it was that effect that really gave it that element of fear which was fantastic however two points Okay, a point and a half, the majority of two points, gets lost because the Thals are so, so boring. I can't stand them. I really can't. Episodes five and six, I was so bored. And when episode six ended and I realised there was an episode seven, I literally was lying on my couch going, ah, for fuck's sake. No, like, I did not want there to be another episode. I'm like, you had an amazing four-part story it ended well they had escaped they were back at the TARDIS I'm like just leave this whole like oh but we don't actually have the fluid link I'm like oh who cares like I just I had no investment in it whatsoever I liked the Ganatus and Barbara thing that was the only redeeming quality of it but the rest of it like five and six in particular I was bored off my nut I found myself like drifting to look at my phone and you know, I was writing my notes as the episode was playing, whereas usually I'd pause it so I wouldn't miss anything. I just genuinely didn't care. Um, and I completely agree with you 100% that that fight at the end, when you compare it with the fight last week, which was so good, that final fight last week was so good. And this, I get the feeling the actors didn't want to damage the prop. <laughs> or they didn't want to hurt themselves on the prop. But it all seems... You know, oh, I'm going to jump, in air quotes, on this Dalek. So I'm just going to very lightly lean against it. And it was just, I found it, comp- it completely destroyed it for me, that fight at the end. Yeah. Because I loved the one between Za and Kal in the last episode so much. So yeah, for me, it was a great Dalek story. A terribly boring Thal story. So unfortunately, it gets a three from me. But that that's fair. Look, and as I said, I didn't. I think where the Tals were kind of filling up space, usually it would like Ian or Barbara or any of the other main characters were there with them. So I suppose I was focused more on their side of things than I was. But the Tals in the background just kind of speaks to the acting of like the the Tardis crew. But I could I can completely understand where that tree is coming from. All right. Yeah, like. I watched the episode before I did the trivia, before I looked up all the stuff, all behind the scenes stuff. And when I saw that Very Lambert, Verity Lambert deliberately extended it to seven episodes, <laughs> I was like, do you hate me? Like, what is it with you? Um, but it's, it's, I'm actually, it kind of bums me out that I didn't enjoy it more because like, I love the Dalek component of it so, so much. Terry did such an amazing job. And you can totally see why this villain has stuck around 
for over 50 years. And like also, I think what some people tend to forget, I know that I tend to forget, is that in the 1960s, there was two feature Doctor Who movies surrounding the Daleks. Now, granted, it's Peter Cushing as the Doctor in a completely different cast, but that, like, that says something that like, a, a, a villain from a TV show sparks such a huge interest that you can make a feature movie out of it. Yeah, and you know, maybe at some point down the line we should review the two of those as well. Not as the main sort of review part, but as like, you know, secondary episodes or something. I think for me though, and there is actually, there's something I left out of the trivia because I forgot to write it down um, that may explain this. And I love how I'm trying to justify my three, even though I don't need to. But is apparently because of the timing of the episode once they got the go ahead to do the story and once Terry Nation was like yeah you know your story outline was really good we need you to write the scripts it was so quick that he wrote a script a day in order to get them done on time wow and for me personally that shows in the world building he did later in the episode but maybe I'm just trying to find excuses for why I didn't like it that much. Uh, I didn't like it. Get over it. Deal with it. <laughs> no, but like again, like it's like we've discussed about what we both thought was good and what we both thought wasn't so good. We'll just have to hope and see that maybe one day the tells might uh, be changed in your estimation. But uh, as it is at the moment, they can uh, stay where they are. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we'll see them again sometime and I'll change my opinion. Yes. Maybe they won't have the same clothes or haircuts. <laughs> so, our first introduction to the Daleks. Again, another interesting discussion, another interesting scoring system between yourself and myself. Next week, we have our first two-parter of Doctor Who, which is The Edge of Destruction. Yeah, and I'm actually really looking forward to going over this again because it has been a very long time since I've seen this one and I'm just curious as to see will it have held up. Yeah, I haven't watched it yet for the recording but I do remember ha- us having great conversations about this episode like 10 years ago. So I'm really looking forward to this next week. So guys, if you would like to hear more about upcoming episodes and join in the discussion with us, uh, you can check us out at Time Team, that's T-I-M-E-T-E-A-M-P on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, or you can email us at timetravelingteamp at teampproductions.com. We'll see you next time for the Edge of Destruction. Bye!